Welcome to the next session of the course Applied Multivariate Statistics. Topic of today is classification. The contents arise, ranges from unsupervised classification to supervised classification. Today we will begin with hierarchical cluster analysis and non-hierarchical cluster analysis. So the learning targets for these topics are to understand the hierarchical cluster analysis and the non-hierarchical cluster analysis. Review questions related to these learning targets you find on this slide and you can go through them by yourself. So what means classification? First we start with unsupervised classification. That means we search for some structure in the data but we don't know the structure beforehand. For example, in this case, we aim to identify hidden structures or groups in the data with similar observations. And this is unsupervised classification. The methods include cluster analysis on the one hand and self-organizing maps. Just to give a few examples in this course, we will restrict our or focus to cluster analysis. <clears throat> in this case you have an example here below. You have on the one hand identifiable groups. You clearly can see in the two-dimensional space an example here for toxicity against chlor atoms in the molecule. You can see that you can delineate groups from the data and these methods are employed to delineate such groups in the data. But you can also have data sets like on the right side where, they, where group structures are not apparent and it would be difficult to delineate groups here. So what are the applications of cluster analysis? First of all, it is the identification of groups as already mentioned. The second objective is then to aggregate data. You have a dimension reduction like for ordination methods because you could replace the membership, the individual observation by the membership to a group and use it in a categorical analysis and this reduces uh, the multidimensionality. In addition, it, there's a, it's a techni technique to visualize the similarity and distance of objects. Um, we will later see how we can use a dendrogram to visualize the cluster solution. And finally, we can identify outliers. These are points that do not belong to one of the groups and can be considered as outliers they might form individual clusters in a cluster analysis or be merged very late to the clusters that are already existing. So how does cluster analysis work? <clears throat> it first of all relies on similarity or distance matrix. We have already encountered distance and similarity measures in the previous part of the course and the aim is always to maximize within group similarity of objects in the cluster and to minimize between group similarity. The result is therefore dependent on similarity and distance measure that has been chosen and there are different types of clustering. The first or most widely employed version is the hierarchical agglomerative clustering. We will later meet a technique that is non-hierarchical. That means that all clusters are formed on the same hierarchical level. And on the other hand, Agglomerative, the opposite of agglomerative would be decisive, which would mean that we start with all, with all objects in one large cluster and break this cluster into groups. 
while agglomerative means we start with all objects as single clusters and merge them during the clustering process. The merging is based on the distance or similarity between the objects. What does this mean? How does this work? Let's look for an example. Let's say we have six sites in which we have observed some organisms or some environmental variables and we have calculated a distance matrix. I don't go into details of calculation of distance matrices. We have already matrices. We have already done this in previous parts of this course. And then we look at the paired distances between objects between sites in this case. And we see that site 1 has the shortest distance to site 2. Site 2 and 3 would also have a similarly short distance, but we now focus on site 1 and 2. All other distances between sites are larger. So we first merge site 1 and site 2 into a cluster. And this means that we now have only five objects left. We have object 1 or site 1. We have the cluster for the objects 2 and 3, for the sites 2 and 3 in this case. And now we recalculate the distances with the other objects. So for site 1 with the cluster 2, 3, we see now that the distance is 1. And this and why this is 1.4 we will learn later on during the state during this session. And we have now distances between the individual, between the merged sites, between the cluster and the other and the other sites. It's not the individual distance anymore. And clustering finishes when all objects are merged into one cluster. So in the next step, we would merge the cluster 2, 3 with the site or object 1 and then have a cluster 1, 2, 3 and recalculate the distances to the sites 4, 5 and 6. Then we can display the data in a so-called cluster dendrogram. On the cluster dendrogram, you have a distance that is displayed along the x-axis and the further you go along the axis, the larger is the distance. And we see that at the relatively short distance here, in this case, the two objects 212 and 214 are merged and then the objects 431 and 432 are merged. And at this point, at, at the distance of 0 0.75 approximately, we merge the cluster 431 and 432 with the, with the object 233. So what we have here as a quantitative interpretation is that this is, gives you this measure, distance measure gives you the similarity between the cluster and 233. It's not the similarity between 233 and each of 431 of, and 432. So that's important to understand. You always interpret the relationship of merged objects of the cluster with the individual sites, in this case, when you have this um, merging process. This is a little bit similar to the interpretation of a phylogenetic tree, phylogenetic tree, apart from the fact that the phylogenetic tree is read the other way around. You start on the right side and you can read here at which time there was a common ancestor, for example, between the squirrel and the guinea pig. And if you go further, move further back in time, you reach a point where, for example, there were common ancestors of the rabbits, 
and of other organisms of another lineage that led to red mouse, beaver and so on. What it doesn't mean is exactly that the rabbit and the squirrel had one ancestor that was a mixture of them. It means only that the mixture of all of these, of the, or the ancestor of all of these here, had a joint ancestor with the rabbit. And the same holds for humans and monkeys on this side. You have primates, New World monkeys, Old World monkeys, lemurs and so on. And all these share an ancestor with rabbits. But if you would look at this point and look at the ancestor when there was a split in the lineages, you wouldn't interpret that there has been an animal that was a mixture of a rabbit and a human. But they just share a common ancestor of a several lineages here. Let's look at an example where can such an analysis be useful. This is an example from invertebrate monitoring in Kenya. And the question was, what are the functional feeding groups in freshwater invertebrates? So, to so food webs can give important information on the ecological status of sites, of network relationships of organisms, and such information is therefore useful. So, what was done in this study is that they analyzed the gut contents of the different organisms and then clustered the gut contents for these individual taxa and therefore merged organisms that have a similar gut content. So you see here the cluster solution and what is clearly formed is one group here. So you have relatively small distances for the merging process of the individual objects to clusters and then you have a very large distance to the next clusters that you see here. The same you have here. These are rather specialist shredders. Um, these are mainly collector species based on the gut content and so on. You see that scrapers and collectors are relatively similar as well, at least more similar than generalist shredders. And that means that they probably feed primarily or primarily act as collector, but can also be scraper and vice versa. So how can we calculate the distances between clusters? And this is a very important point to understand that explains why cluster analysis can have very different solution. Because when we merge a cluster, there are different options. First of all, you could say, well, from our, our, our initial points, we just take the average of the distances between the points and calculate the average of all individual distances of all objects in the cluster. But we could also say, well, the distances between two clusters or between an object and a cluster is given by the shortest distance of an individual object in the, if, if of the, by the minimum distance between the two objects from the different clusters. That's what is shown here and what is called the single linkage. Or we could take the opposite approach and look at the maximum distance between cluster A and cluster B. Obviously, this leads to very different cluster solutions. We are on the one hand, we have the average linkage. That means the space is conserved. So the distance, the initial distance and the final distance of the cluster solution is relatively similar because we take the average of the initial distances and therefore it's so-called space conserving. We have the single linkage approach that forms clusters based on the minimum distance. That means 
space is contracted here so objects me move much closer to one another in terms of distance than they actually are and we have space dilating methods that is or approaches that is the complete linkage approach where the distances between different clusters are pronounced so you see here the different pictures for the same data so with the complete linkage we really focus on the differences between clusters or between the objects in clusters for the single linkage we we focus on similarities here's another example for a data set really the most extreme cases are contrasted here we have on the one hand a single linkage cluster solution we see that all individual cases from relatively merge relatively quickly into um, one cluster and you see here this is the distance it's called height in r in the graph the distance is 0 0.02 whereas for the complete linkage where we focus on differences we can see that the distance are much larger it's about tenfold um, larger and we can see that the differences distances between individual objects and clusters are higher we can also see that the clustering structure looks very different here we get we obtain small and distant clusters so we could interpret this that we have perhaps one cluster here one cluster here and one cluster here but we have large and very close clusters here so the structure is relatively different and we would interpret these three as outliers perhaps and the other objects belonging into one large cluster and a different interpretation would hold for this complete linkage approach so there are many more options in cluster analysis you can have exclusive clustering and non-exclusive exclusive exclusive means that objects are just put in one cluster that's something that we have followed so far and then we took the approach for hierarchical clustering it means clusters are arranged hierarchical relationships are defined that is something that we have seen so far so we have these dendrograms these trees that emerge from the cluster solution and we can also we will also look at non-hierarchical clustering that means we have maximum within cluster homogeneity but that there are no relationships or defined relationships among the clusters and that means we don't have a cluster dendrogram or a tree like we have seen before the agglomerative clustering means we build groups the divisive would be we start with one clusters and break groups i've already mentioned this and this is the approach we mainly will look at here hierarchical agglomerative clustering and afterwards non-hierarchical um, agglomerative clustering non-exclusive clustering would mean that um, object has a membership value and can be assigned to different clusters you can have overlapping and continuous clusters um, this different approaches are, can be looked up in the Everett 2011 book that is very useful for clustering and look for the topic of fuzzy based clustering and overlapping clustering in R, the function or the package that you would use is called um, is the package cluster and the function funny. Now we move on to non-hierarchical cluster analysis. In this analysis, we have assign objects to a predefined number of clusters k. So we need to define before whether we want to have four five or six different clusters and the problem that comes up here is the illustrated here let's say we want 
to look for three groups and we have a sample size of 15. That means that we have all, already 2 million possible partitions of the, of, of the objects between the clusters in case we look at identity of the groups as well. Let's say we have four groups and have 20 different samples then we are already facing, facing 45 billion options and the problem gets more or less unsurmountable um, when we have a sample size of 25 and 8 different groups. So calculating is relatively difficult for all possible solutions so you need some kind of algorithm. And what does this algorithm do? do the, what does the algorithm do? It partitions the objects and k groups then it moves objects and calculates the change and chooses afterwards the best solution and repeats the steps 2 to 3 until the cluster criterion doesn't improve. So what is the criterion to assess what is the best solution? Well it's minimization of the sum of squares within clusters against the, uh, between cluster sum of squares and here you note the, uh, can note the analogy to ANOVA and ANOVA in the F test is also the ratio of within sum of squares to um, between, between group sum of squares. In fact it's some kind of pseudo F statistic that is employed here. So interpretation is relatively similar of the test statistic that is used. It relies this clustering, this k means clustering implicitly relies on the Euclidean distance, again a similarity to the ANOVA case, and to use it with ecological data requires some data preparation, for example transformation of data. Further techniques in cluster analysis is partitioning around meduits, so it's similar to k-means but you can use different distance metrics and it's non-Euclidean. You can have the non-hierarchical cluster, clustering for large data set in R in the function Clara, also a cluster package. And then you have model-based clustering, which estimates model parameters from data assumes, uh, and assumes a specific cluster structure and does hypothesis testing. And you can finally have variable clustering, which is really useful to identify multicollinearity. So it creates a dendrogram of the relationship between the variables and allows for a little bit easier interpretation of the collinearity than a correlation matrix or something like that. Well, some limitations of cluster analysis. There is clearly a tendency for specific spherical clusters which the approach is basically picking up. You have interpretation of results that can be ambiguous, so depending on the chosen method and chosen distance metric and so on and therefore it has been called rather an art than a science. Nevertheless it represents a valuable tool for exploratory studies and in different scientific fields. So I want to finish this portray of cluster analysis with a quotation from Everett et al. And they state, the methods of cluster analysis can be valuable tools in the exploration of, multi of multivariate data. Applying the methods in practice, practice however, requires considerable care if overinterpretation is to be avoided. Simply applying a particular method of cluster analysis and accepting the solution at face value is in general not adequate. So and with this I move to the application in R
and you can open your script. We have the student script here and the first thing that we typically do is to set the working directory. So you should know how to do this or you have time or stop the video and do this on your own. Then we move on to loading the library vegan and the data that we use. We use a data set that includes information on governmental stream monitoring, on the one hand species information that have been found in the science and on the other hand we have information on the grouping structure in the environmental variables file. We don't need this at the moment because we want to check how good the clustering process is in unraveling this grouping structure. So we first check for them when we work with species data what are the species maximo or what we see in an overview here for the different species is that we have species that have abundances up to 15,000 and others have a very low maximum for example plumatella spec and what we can conclude from this is that we need some downweighing of highly abundant taxa because otherwise all distances will be governed by the highly abundant species. In addition we want to remove some species without occurrences here or that are very rarely occurring. So we do this similar to what we have done in the RDA analysis, check out the script if you don't know this anymore. We first calculate the presence absences for the data and then look at how often species occur in the data set. <clears throat> so this is done in this line. We calculate the sum for this data and then we sort and we see that there are many species that never occur in the data set and some that just occur in one of the sites. Given that we look for groups, um, species that just occur in one of the sites or never occur are of course not very helpful for finding a grouping structure. So we remove these species and that's done in this line. It means that we remove first of all the first column of the data set, the first column gives the site and we don't need this, we only want to have the pure species information for the next steps when we transform the data and we have on the other hand here the removal of sites that where species um, of, of species, we have a removal of species that occur in less than two sites. Execute this. And then we apply the function maximum to see again the differences between abundances and species and we see that still the range is from one species has a maximum of 8, about 10 individuals, the other one has 15,000 so it's a strong difference. And if we try different transformations, first of all the square root transformation but we still have two orders of magnitude between the maxima and the species. So we choose for the later analysis the double square root transformation, which means that we have the maximum within a tenfold distance. So that's what we apply and assign as a new data set. Now let's create a pre Curtis distance matrix. We lose we have abundance data so we use uh, pre curtains and this is automatically applied if you execute the vectist function. However be careful that in the dist function there is Euclidean distance the default setting. And now we run our first cluster analysis. What we choose here is the data set not not the data set, rather the distance-based data 
distances between the individual objects in the data or a distance matrix and we select a clustering method here we select the average method that means we try to conserve the space between the objects so we execute this and now let's have a look at the results that's our first cluster dendrogram we have here the different sites from which the species originate and we can see that we have mostly two sites that are relatively similar that are quickly merged with each other uh, apart from the site 7 and we have a clear separation in two clusters here when we look at um, the overall structure. Now we have to ask how many groups are optimal? Is there a jump in the dissimilarity or where, what we should we look at? And we look whether we see some jump in the data and we see that this is not really the case here. Perhaps when we have two clusters there is a larger jump from two to three here to, this, to having three clusters and then this continues until we have very many um, clusters. So perhaps also there's a larger jump in the beginning from 12 to 11 clusters and so on. But the other steps are rather smaller. It's not too clear in this case. And so Wolf here, uh, Wolf here uh, plays the different steps in the clustering and this plot. There are different, many more graphical and statistical tools to, for deciding um, how many crops are groups are optimal, but we're not gonna to look in de into details here. So once we decided on the number of clusters, we can have look uh, use uh, different techniques and different function that's direct dot h class argument and this argument uses the cluster solution you provide here how many groups you find optimal and you can then highlight these groups in the data set here in blue so for example if you wanted to have um, three groups then you would have this solution and it's indicated in the plot. You can also use this result now to assign memberships to the individual data. So with the cut tree function you say cut the tree at the position where we have only two clusters. We execute this command this function and what we see is then we obtain a vector that tells us to which cluster the individual objects belong to so this gives you the grouping structure so such a result should actually not be used in a manova or a permanova setting to now check for statistical significances you will see a warning example below where it's shown that even for complete random data when you do some clustering that afterwards after the clustering process you have more or less always statistical significance of the solution so it's relatively non-informative. Also the PLC class function this function shows you the to which cluster and the individual objects belong and you could also use labels for these type of plots. It seems there's a warning here that the PLC cluster class function is deprecated doesn't mean it's, it's not used anymore and in the future we should use the plot function instead. 
there are more tools and they can be checked um, here on the website for the Clusterfly package. Now let's look at the statistics a little bit. What is the similarity between the clustering solution and the initial distances? And the cluster solution is provided in a so-called cofinetic, cofinetic matrix. So what we can do is we calculate the relationship between the cofinetic matrix and the distance matrix. So first we can close this and we see how the cofinetic matrix looks like. It's again, it's just a matrix that tells something that provides us information of the distances between objects. And you can see that based on the cluster solution here that we have often a very similar distance. And this is because we have put these objects in a similar cluster. So Vera class has in fact been the case um, with two groups and the average linkage. Then we look at the correlation between the initial matrix and the cofinetic matrix and we see that they are correlated relatively highly. You would have a lower co correlation for the average linkage, uh, for the single linkage or complete linkage. What we can also do is to calculate the stress measure, stress one, that's the same measure as for the NMDS from this matrix, this is shown here, and we had, um, we would have a stress value of 0 0.14, and if you remember correctly, then in the context of NMDS, we discussed that any value up to 1, 0 0.15 is probably acceptable and, inter and, and relatively well to interpret. We can also check the clusters that have resulted in an NMDS. So we first conduct the NMDS. Then we define some colors and now we plot the results. And this is what we see. We have on the one hand we have upstream sites and we have downstream sites here and they are merged into clusters, you see that the downstream side here is actually put into the first cluster in our clustering process, whereas the other sides are in, um, in relatively homogeneous and delineated from the other ones. So nevertheless, you have to take into account here that of course in nature you never or rarely have this clear cuts you mostly have gradients and whether this downstream side is really a downstream side it's uh, actually um, for salinization of a german river you have sites before the input of salts and sites after the input of salts and this would still be a downstream side but you see um, that it's relatively similar to the upstream side so it's probably uh, upstream from the salt discharge so you see that's probably um, the communities are still relatively similar to the upstream sign and this can be due to ecological processes also for example there may be effects but because of migration you still have similar communities to the upstream sites which does where the organisms do not face the effects of salinization So this point may be wrongly classified from a statistical point of view, but on the other hand, there may be reasons um, why this is the case, ecological reasons. So here's this extra session on this warning example. I will jump over this, have a look into this if you're interested. So we construct here, testers, the clusters from completely random data and show that they in many cases are uh, statistically significant. This script, this part would probably run about 10 minutes or five to 10 minutes at least. 
depending on your computer power and so I won't do this now. And afterwards you have an exercise in the script and you should conduct the cluster analysis for the class data, standardize the environmental variables before analysis using the scale function um, that just is the aim that you don't have one of the environmental variables dominating the others and then compare the results for complete single and average linkage clustering and check the correlations of the kinetic matrix with the initial distance matrix matrices for these three clustering approaches methods. Then check the groups. We have groups for the data. You actually use them in a different exercise and then we load these groups and we have a look at the groups and, uh, and compare them to the cluster solution and evaluate um, the match between the results of the cluster analysis and the group membership that is given by was given by the data. And you will obtain an uh, exercise solution from us in the, the other script once we have finished this session. And then I move on to non-hierarchical clustering and I use also this class data set. We have worked with the class data set. It contains information, chemical information, and you will see this when you just call the question mark. It contains chemical information on archaeological class vessels that have been found in um, Antwerp around Antwerp and the question is whether these are all from the same source for example or from different sources and whether there is a grouping structure. You see here we first scale the data and then we conduct a k-means clustering. So how does the function, how do you read this function? You say with centers four means that we want to have for four groups iteration maximum means is the maximum number where changes are done in the clustering and evaluated whether this leads to better solution and you, the computer has to start with a certain co cluster configuration and we start here with 100 different ones and you could also change the values by orders of magnitude and check what, ha what happens. If you increase the number of starts very often, uh, much, much, maybe if you increase this number um, strongly, we'll also see that this takes much more time. Just keep it very small at very limited time here. Um, now we obtain this cluster solution. And we use this cluster solution um, in the visualization. First of all, we conduct again an NMDS for display. We use the groups from our cluster solution, K classes our cluster solution, and we plot the data. So here's our resulting window. What we see is that on one hand the points are given by the NMDS and what we have displayed here is the clusters from the cluster solution we have called here for four different clusters and we see that indeed most of the objects are classified as we would expect. We have the cluster 4 here, cluster 1, but we see that actually here for these data points it's not so clear that you would have two different clusters, but it needs to be taken into account that of course the match of the real distances with the dis display distances is not 100% in an NMDS. However, 
is typically if you have no idea or have not much idea of the data it's of course difficult to come up with a number of groups that you would expect in a data set and therefore you there are different criteria that have been developed to evaluate how the cluster solution compares um, to this to a criterion and one criterion is the so-called Kalinsky criterion in the cascade km function this means this function uses different number of groups for the k-means algorithm and then calculates for each result the relationship between the between cluster the relationship in the between cluster variants uh, to the within cluster variants and obviously the higher the relationship of the with uh, of the between cluster variants to the within cluster variants is the better is the cluster solution so you want to have low within cluster variants and very high between cluster variants so we run this and what you see here uh, what is given here is, is the criterion that you use for evaluation and we can plot now plot the results if we do this we have here information on the k-means clustering that shows you where objects are put put into which cluster and the number of groups and we see that if we have just two groups these objects are in group one and most of the objects are in group two if we have three groups again the group the yellow the orange objects are still mostly in the same group and so on and here we have the Kalinsky criterion and we see that the value is actually highest for two clusters but it can also it's not this is not you typically the case what you can also have is that you have that you have some um, larger values later on here for example there could be a peak coming up here but this time is not the, the case and if we select based on the Kalinsky criterion to which cluster the individual group uh, the individual object belongs to we can extract this information and could use this now as a group vector. And finally, we can obtain the column names and we have now here two groups for this data. So that's it. Now you would have the exercise to compare the solutions with two and four group, two and four groups with NMDS, and decide what you regard as most appropriate for this data set. So have fun with this exercise, and I hope and hopefully you tune in for the last session for supervised classification approaches.